Hey all, so this is the last of the screen recordings that I'm going to show you. Um, it's the most complex of them and it shows you how easily and I think quickly this stuff can get a little bit out of hand in terms of trying to manage how multiple people interact. But I think that's also part of the beauty of, of this is that it shows the complexity in a way that it could be overwhelming. Um, it shows that there is so much intellectual and uh, mental activity going on on scenes. There's a lot of communicative and um, medi mediational work that firefighters are doing as individuals and as teams. And this visualization in particular gets at that. So again, here's some key aspects of this. Um, in comparison back to Chief Burke's data visualization, I want to reiterate that this is based off observational data and it's based in as close to the same activity as possible as Chief Burke. This crew is working in a training setting to simulate their work that they would engage in um, at a structure fire. Chief Burke's visualization is based on interview data. This is based on a set of observational data that includes images and audio recordings and video recordings and thermal imaging video recordings. And so from those, I transcribed and coded as I, desired, as I kind of walked through in the data ops page. And so you can see some of the things here. And so like I can point to those, for instance, um, here in a minute. Let's stop and just kind of start right at the center of this data visualization for now. I have all these nodes on, and I think it's helpful to do that for just the beginning of this. So the center node for this visualization is personnel. So off of this, we have three key kind of actors or agents in this, in, in this observational activity. We have the environment, we have the team, and we have Lieutenant Lamb. So there's actually additional teams here, but in order to just kind of limit some of the complexity, I've taken one team out because they're in standby mode. So it doesn't really take a lot away from what we can see crews doing. They're doing stuff even as they're kind of in standby mode that's worth noting. But it, it, in, order of, in order to kind of simplify this, at least to some extent, I made that decision. So again, we have Lieutenant Lamb over here. We have personnel as the center node. We have environment that's acting in a certain way on this incident, and we also have the team acting in itself. And so we can walk through those nodes, but I want to go back to the, um, the data ops page, for instance, and talk through one of the moments that you might have seen in those videos. And so in that video, you see a crew crawling in through a basement, and one firefighter has their hand on the wall, right? And so that's Firefighter Ennis. If we like pull this one right out here, we see that Firefighter Ennis has their hand on the wall. And they also, when they get up to where they're simulating that there's a, a mattress, it's actually one of the burn crates that they use to put the fires in. But uh, one of the practices that they do there is they pretend that that's a mattress and they search it. Um, it's just like a local way that they train. So I've represented that here in that way. So off firefighter Ennis, you could have seen him walk up and kind of hold his hand against the wall. And then he feels that, that burn crate and he starts tapping it. That's him simulating that to make sure that there's no one, you know, on that mattress. Instructors sometimes hide the rescue dummies in, in that spot as well. Um, Cause it's a place where a lot of people are just kind of skip over. So part of it is to get people to really get thorough and learn thorough habits for searching space. Um, so you can see that those practices are, are from that video are literally represented here. We also see that um, Firefighter Ennis is the firefighter responsible for managing the Team 2 radio communications. So off of that, we see that there's some things that um, Firefighter Ennis is doing as well. For instance, Firefighter Ennis, there's some radio feedback that occurs because his radio is too close to some other firefighters' radios. Um, he's receiving and listening for messages, and he's also tr transmitting the personnel, personnel accountability report. Now notice, and or recall back to that video again, 
one of the things that you saw that was really significant about that is that even though Firefighter Ennis is responsible for the radio communications, Lieutenant Lamb calls in at that moment and says, hey, Team 2, I need a PAR check. What we see is the team stops for a moment and everybody is listening and there's a bit of a, a kind of a group discussion before they do anything. And, and what that crew noted that they were doing is that they were trying to piece together what is Lieutenant Lamb asking for. They had all heard bits and pieces of it. And so they kind of got together. You saw their, their personal, like they closed space between one another. They kind of hugged each other in, to, so to speak. And then they, they started trading oral messages um, to make sense of what was the request that was made in terms of information. And then they figured that out. They identified perhaps what they wanted to say. And then you see that um, Firefighter Ennis keys the mic. You can hear it. There's a certain sound that occurs when you key that button, when you press the button to key it. And then you see Team 2 s sending that message out orally. So Firefighter Ennis is speaking on behalf of the team, sending that out. So that's just one little part of practice within a larger um, element. And you can see how complex the mod modal richness that firefighters are working off here involves. Again, let's kind of pull this away um, for a second as well. Again, in addition to the oral and the, uh, the oral feedback that we have, we have kinesthetic and tactile practice. You know, that's how this crew's working. We have different people working, doing different parts of the activity. We have distributive labor going on. We have firefighter Ennis over here is connected to Team 2 as well. That firefighter is waving tools. They're using their tools to span and to cover space and to ensure that perhaps no one's there. And also, we see... Um, pointing and monitoring. We see Firefighter Larimore pointing as well. We see that the team's engaging in air management, which is a cognitive thing, and the team's also engaging in a discussion of things. So off this Team 2 node, we have a good bit of activity that's going on. And then we can pr pull this part of Lieutenant Lamb over there. And so we could walk through all of Lieutenant Lamb's activity. But the point is, is that really, as you work through this, what I want you to see is if we go down here into the environmental node, we don't see any of these crew members pulling out texts and books and reading them and getting directions on how to do their, their work. As technical and professional communicators, they're acting in a way that's really different. They are still influenced by text and alphabetic activity. It's, it's not to say that, that 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 stuff doesn't matter. It really much does. And so down here off this environment node, you know, I have, um, I've noted some of those other kinds of aspects. We have the National Incident Management System and the Incident Command System framework that everyone's practicing under. It's why there's an incident manager, and it's why that these folks have tags that they've tagged into um, Lieutenant Lamb's, for instance, accountability board that represents them symbolically and metaphorically as they work. That's part of NIMS. And also there's the national standards down here that all pertain to the work that they do. There's a lot more standards than the, the like seven that I've chosen to visualize here. Um, but these are some seven eight significant standards that are I influencing work here at this particular scene. For instance, 1403 is the standard that influences how to and kind of dictates how to uh, run a, a live burn evolution safely. So uh, it has information on what qualifications a firefighter needs to have in order to be a live burn instructor. Um, down here, we have the fire instructor standard as well. So in addition to the firefighters practicing here, you have firefighters working as instructors within this you know, framework and making sure that they meet the qualifications and that the burn is being conducted in a way that, that aligns to that standard. There's backup hose lines at this incident. There's multiple um, 
water supplies sources being used and those things are codified in those standards so you can see even without um, people pulling out the manuals that those manuals and those standards are impacting the work that the folks are doing um, just by simply of of the fact that they're aligning with what those standards are and so it's really interesting to see kind of that aspect of thing of practice here and then finally, what else kind of really stands out is that we see, um, you know, the environment, the fire itself acts in some ways. The superheated gases force the crews to crawl because it's too hot. Um, they can feel those, those gases. They can feel the heat, so they're getting down low. Um, the smoke outside tells Lieutenant Lamb, and it offers Lieutenant Lamb a piece of information he can use in order to communicate with the, 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 the crews. He can tell, um, hey, based off this smoke, I know that the fire is likely here. And at one point he makes a radio t transmission where he says, hey team, be aware, this is what the conditions look like from outside. And this side of the building in particular seems like it may be an intense, have an intense fire load. So he's kind of pointing them spatially to a place where the risk might be outside. So again, you see the crews working in this distributed fashion where one's kind of responsible for a certain role and activity, and then they use these interface components like the radio or touch, depending on where they are in that, in that kind of distributed network of work, in order to do mediational and communicative activity. It's really pretty, when you think about it like that, it's really fascinating um, to work through. So. Again, you have some time, um, or when you have some time, consider clicking through the visualizations. But that's what's there. Um, you know, there's a lot more complexity here, and you're welcome to kind of navigate through them. I guess the only other thing that I'd like to show you is this: um, when you, you know, have one of these, if we go into page source, you could go to the actual visualization. Let's go down and find where it's hiding. Give me one moment so I can find the iframe. There it is. So if we go here, if you click, I'm going to go back and do that again. So if you go to view source for this web text and then you look for the iframe, which is here, iframe container, and you see sources, data viz, burkonseam.html, you'll be able to click on that. And then from there, you can go to the script source. And if you want to look at the, um, the data structure itself, this is a great way to do that. So again, here's another way of visually understanding um, that same visualization that you're seeing represented as nodes and links. This is just the source and kind of target and type. There's three main kind of parts of um, the visualization and then it's really about how you connect each one of those pieces to each other. So for instance, like we have the main incident management key branches here, observe, plan, and communicate. And then off of them, I've segmented it where you can see that there's an observing and information gathering segment. There's a monitoring cruise segment and this is Chief Burke again. So this isn't Orderville, but it gets at some of that stuff. You can see in the data structure itself how things connect. So it's another way to visually interact and work through this data set. Um, and it's there for you to think through and, and to, to access. So um, I encourage you to not just look at what you can see in the visualizations there, but also to kind of click into the, um, the actual source content and see what's worth um, investigating there if you're so interested. Thank you for your time. Bye.